the next person to come up and speak will be Professor Dr. Pierre Tapier. And Pierre has the wonderful but terrible job of trying to weave a red thread through our discussions. That is to say, his job is to try and pick the nuggets from the different presentations and weave them together into some sort of garland, I guess. Some sort of uh, thread which we can consider a kind of dialogue between the different presentations that have been held. He will be coming up twice a day to give uh, this red thread. He is personally very keen to create an environment for students to become entrepreneurs. He trains and develops students to be entrepreneurs. And he is also very interested in educating people to think long term as entrepreneurs. Uh, one of his passions is to see business schools changed so that they can inculcate long term thinking. And uh, I would invite you, please, to welcome Pierre Tapier. Thank you very much, uh, Prabhu, to, for this kind introduction. Uh, I have the most awful role I have ever had in any Congress, which is I am supposed to, be, to, to speak five times in front of a very, very prestigious audience of very bright brains, not paraphrasing the person who have told before, while persons are just starving to go to the break. So this is a challenge. Thank you, thank you to Christopher. It's a honor. Um, but uh, so I will try to bother you as less as possible. But as Prado mentioned, uh, to try to pinpoint a few of the of the sparkling ideas that we have grasped all around uh, our journey. The first thing I will say is. Um, Arriving here in this conference, uh, we are probably keen, every one of us is probably keen in returning home with uh, a few things uh, which will last longly in his or her memory. And so this is a time uh, of approach that I will try to have, uh, re re rearranging a few items, uh, but trying to put that in a perspective. Um, this morning, this morning, no, this afternoon, of course, the, this afternoon, when we have been challenged first uh, by, by Christopher, he invites us in regarding the servant leadership paradigm uh, to regard us with our ability to become entrepreneurs, leaders, and uh, a person able to go towards statemanship. And I think these three items, the entrepreneurs creating economic value, the leader who will transform something in uh, his direct environment, and also the statementship, which means that the person will be directly connected in one way or another uh, with uh, the public society and the politics, uh, is something, it's one of the, the three le level of uh, analysis that we will have during all our journey. I think a, a second one, which is not exactly the same one, but which has been mentioned uh, deeply by within the dialogue between uh, Father Nicola Buffett and, and Jacob uh, a little earlier, is the, di the dialogue between the macro level, the meso level of the company, and the personal level at the, the level of the consciousness. And I will try to, to, to phrase out the thing according the three, three uh, axis, if I can say so. The first thing uh, that I pointed out uh, uh, from uh, uh, Nicholas uh, is uh, what is our time today? And we can have a debate on that in our mind, probably because we took uh, seven or 10 or 15 hours to arrive in Zermatt this morning. Uh, probably we are very motivated and convinced that we are at a special time of the history. But remar remind the very numerous crisis uh, that uh, Nicholas uh, has mentioned. Um, Churchill was very, very convinced that he was at a unique time. And uh, in 1893, the person living there was convinced too. Uh, so my point is, there is an argument, and I have my, this argument in, in my faculty, when people argue on the fact that maybe we are just, uh, I would say, fearing a few signals, but just living a crisis after another one. So we are on a chronos time. This is my point. We are on a chronos time. 
Are we on a Kronos type or are we on a Kairos type? The reason why I would rather support the argument, probably with most of you, but it just gives you a small additional idea to convince the others, because we are probably more or less convinced of the same thing here, but sometimes we try to reinforce our own argument towards the outside world, is that uh, between 1961 and 2011, something happened. In 1961, the whole planet was using 0.6 planet every year um, uh, in order to use the port of natural resources that was needed for the, the moment of the economy. In a year more or less 76, and I was glad to hear the mention of the, the, club, the, uh, the club of Rome a little earlier, in a year 76, we begin to use one planet yearly. This was a tipping point, 75, 70, 76. In 2007, which is the last measurement, we were using 1.6. We are today using 1.6 planets. Uh, Europe is using three, and United States is using six. So I think there is a reason to, to argue the fact that we are on a Kairos moment. Because if you see that point of usage of natural resources on one side, and on the second side, the issue, of course, of demography, uh, we are not in a normal world. And the speed of the transformation today, because of that, uh, linked, of course, and this is linked, of course, to, to the, the, the global warming, is something which is real. The, the level of uh, carbon dioxide emission during the last 50 years, I don't know if you have this very small information in your mind, between 61 and 2010, the level of carbon dioxide emission has increased by a factor of 11. So I would rather argue we are on a Kairos moment. The second point I will emphasize is, uh, um, I think there, there, were, there was a, a, an interesting contradiction in the dialogue uh, between uh, um, Christopher, Nicholas, uh, and Jacob. Uh, in the position of the people with his or her consciousness on one side and the system on the other. I am seeing there two points of tension. The first one, uh, which uh, uh, Jacob has emphasized very, very uh, uh, soundly and appropriately, is the reality of the day-to-day -day life of most of the working people is that we are in a very atomized system. And the paradigm of competition, whatever it will be between person, between companies, even between states, is today the dominant paradigm we are in bed in. We are in a, in a system which is atomizing one another. Because these persons who are feeling so are suffering, the person who are suffering of that and who are conscious to suffer of that are today asking for probably a better equilibrium between their EQ, their IQ, EQ, and SQ, as Father Nicola uh, invites us to think about. And I think that in many uh, Western countries or OECD country, uh, this item is true. But Malika, very short moment, ask a question that nobody has answered. What will I say to my poor guys in the village, which, who I will try uh, to, to make conscious that saving water is important? This part of uh, being, I would say, more conscious of, of the limits of our model is in one part, in, in some part, is a luxury. But the large, large part of the, of the human kingdom wants to consume and desire to consume. So how, between the system and uh, the consciousness of the person who, for a large part of that, would just like to enter in the same system that the system we are today criticizing, how we can find an appropriate balance on that point? And a last 
item that I will put in the, in the red throat, uh, in the red throat will be the question of growth. Uh, around the question of growth and of economic growth, of course, th there are two questions, I think, there. The first one is how growth uh, can be compatible uh, with uh, the scarcity of natural resource. This is one thing. And uh, a number of advocates uh, against, well, uh, toward the, the paradigm of zero growth, I would say, or even um, degrowth, uh, are persons who are very keen in uh, uh, sustainable development and who are very keen on scarcity of natural resource. But growth and environmental pr preservation is not exactly the same thing. There are areas uh, where you have a huge amount of economic growth in areas which are not, uh, of course, uh, using natural resources. And this is one of, of, the, of the open avenue. But uh, the second item behind that is uh, what is today the yardstick of our measurement for success? Is growth and economic creation the appropriate yardstick? I am finished. Uh, is what is behind growth is it the hidden paradigm of progress? Because any human being, whoever is, has the desire to progress, because desire is at our very root. And uh, uh, growth has been one of the very pale, uh, very vague expression of progress and hope. But how we can measure that? Uh, do, we, do we claim and do we argue from going from GDP to uh, Human Development Index and to return to the dialogue between Amartya Sen and Milton Friedman? I think uh, during this, before the, the, the round table on financial, which I will return a little later, I think the, the issue of what are the appropriate yardstick of growth, progress, or development of peoples are among the questions that we should address interestingly during these two days. Thank you.